Hello, this is Matt. I'm going to do a quick overview on how to do this deposition dry lab. Um, so you can refer back to this for, for some of the hints and tricks to get this done successfully. Alright, so you should be seeing on your screen the um, deposition dry lab Moodle um, topic. And we've laid it out in a nice organized manner. So I'm going to go through it just like you would. Um, uh, to, to complete this lab successfully. So I've included a page in here on key links and instructions for this lab. So if you click on it, okay, it should open up and it tells you the first thing you want to do is read the oxide growth calculator activity, which I'll show you in a minute, and then read the lab write-up template file next. So you have an idea of what's expected in terms of your write-up. Um, then we have some key online sources. Some of these links are also included in the PDF file. So I'll just click on it and show you what happens. So if I click on um, the abstract link, you can get a rough idea of what is included in an abstract. So part of, part of what you're going to write in your lab report is an abstract, also known as an overview. Okay. And then if you have trouble doing citations, I expect you to put your references in there. One of the references will be the Brigham Young University site. Um, but if you need to know how to format that and have an easy time of it, you can use EasyBib. Okay, so that link brings you here, and you can pick what you want um, to, to reference. So here is the MLA format, which is what most people typically use. Um, you're going to do a website, and you can click in the URL here and it'll help you, uh, guide you through how to um, properly um, reference that. Okay, and if you want to really get into it um, and see what engineers have to do when they publish something, you can go to the IEEE um, citation reference manual and you can see that uh, they have a lot of different examples in here of how different things are supposed to be referenced if you want to publish in IEEE journals. Okay, so IEEE is an international um, engineering uh, consortium uh, and they have a multitude of different journals that they produce. Um, you'll also be um, going to the Brigham Young site and I put these links here so you can use that. You'll be um, determining the thickness of oxide at different times and under different conditions. So if you do what the if you click on thickness given time, it'll take you to that website on the Brigham Young University Clean Room website. This is a really good reference. So you know you can see what the graph looks like here. You can put in um, initial thickness, the temperature, the crystal orientation, if it's a wet or dry oxidation, and um, you put in the time that you want to look at and it'll actually give you the, the thickness in, um, after that time. So let's say you want to do 10 minutes, you would put 0 hours and um, 10 minutes here. Okay, I want to look at the 100 crystal orientation so I leave that alone, but let's say um, you know I don't start at, at 25 angstroms but maybe I start somewhere around um, 10 angstroms, which is typical for native oxide. And you can go ahead and then hit calculate and it'll update what the thickness is after 10 minutes um, at this temperature. Now what would you expect if the temperature was lower in the same case? So let's say I only am doing um, say 800 degrees uh, Celsius and I hit calculate. Well then I'd only have 48 angstroms. So you can see there's a big um, dependence on temperature in terms of thickness for a given time. So you're going to go through this lab and, and do multiple scenarios and create a chart um, and, and, and get that data. So you can export these files to CVS files as well. Play around with that um, or you can go point by point and, and write down the, um, the thicknesses for various conditions. And you know you can change you know from wet to dry you'll find out that it's even slower growth. Um, you go to 111 and you know it has yet another growth rate. Okay, so if I go back 
And notice um, I've set most of these up to open up in new windows so you can just click on your tab to get back to where you were. And then I've added a couple of YouTube videos here for your reference so you can look at how to do graphs in Excel. These are two decent um, um, YouTube videos I found that explains how to do graphs. And then I also have a, a YouTube video that I created on how to find the slope of a line and different methods for doing that. So I encourage you to, to view that as well. Notice these YouTube videos are two minutes, six minutes, and uh, again, two minutes respectively. And then I'll be adding this um, YouTube video that I'm creating now so that you can get an overview of everything. Okay, so those are the key instructions. If I go back using the breadcrumbs to the deposition dry lab, so we just looked at that. Now we'll take a look at the um, oxide growth calculator activity. So this is the PDF um, instruction file. So if I, if I bring that up to full screen, you can see what that looks like. And there are also live links in here to, that take you to the same sites that I just mentioned. So this is the um, detailed um, uh, view of the, of the actual um, request or activity that you have to complete. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and zoom in so you can see this better. So you're going to you're going to get data from a model online. So you're going to use these two sites to determine uh, wet oxidation for these different conditions from, you know, 1 minute to about 10 hours. Now, I don't expect you to do every single minute over those 10 hours. Um, you can do maybe the first 10 minutes and then go every 10 minutes after that and then go every hour after that. Um, and then create your, your graph that way. So you do it for these um, six different conditions and then you can plot it on one um, curve. And then I want you to do the same thing for the 111 crystal orientation at these two temperatures, okay? So that'll be um, more self-explanatory as we move on in this video. Uh, you're going to calculate the deposition rates okay at these three different times so you'll see that the rate changes depending on how long you've been depositing um, you're going to review the table and and look at um, you know try to analyze what the table is telling you so you're going to make up this table and and then you'll be able to review it and then you're going to do some analysis so these are some questions that i've included um, in in the write-up that you will have to answer in your write-up Okay, and then you can go to this website here to um, compare your model data from the Brigham Young University website with this website. And you can act actually look at this data set as well and do those comparisons. So your documentation will require a title, abstract and overview section, resources, experimental setup, the procedure section, all your data and tables and graphs, uh, an analysis which includes the answers to the questions and a uh, reference or of your source materials or citations. So you can call it a bibliography or references or citations, either one. Uh, I, I don't really care, it's just I want you to have those separate sections. And then, you, you know, I want you to turn in the requested graphs and tables in, um, in, the, in the Word document or actually you're going to convert it to a PDF file preferably and then you can also include your Excel file as well. So I've given you the opportunity to include both files. Okay, when you make graphs, make sure the, the, the graphs have titles and axis labels and legends. So you see that here. Here, here's, uh, here, here are labels on your two axes and here's your um, axis um, title. And then usually we put a title on top of the graph to tell you what it is that it's showing you. Okay, and then you can see these labels for the different curves or you can create a legend and I'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, so uh, I'll do a short tutorial on how to do that in Excel. And then you want to do written documentation. Um, make sure that it includes all the answers to the questions in complete sentences and in paragraph form. Okay. So let me see if I can get back to, to where I was. I'll minimize this page that comes up as a pop-up. So I can go ahead and close that. Okay, and I, I inadvertently opened like three windows by clicking on it too many times. 
Okay, so that's the, that's the activity. So those are the basic instructions you need um, to perform the lab. And then, well, how are you going to write it up? So there's this template that I've created. Okay, so you can see it here. So you can download the Word document version of it. I've also included that. And you, you want to put your title up here. You want to put your name. And if you work with a lab partner, which I'll consider, uh, you can put both your, your names there. Uh, whatever this class is, so this would be MEMS 2192, and the date that you wrote it up. Okay, so you have a nice record of it, and this is really good to do um, and do it well, and you can include it in your portfolio. So when you go for job uh, interviews, um, you can show them a sample of your lab write up work, and that would be greatly appreciated by interviewers. So you want to have a overview or abstract um, subtitle here, uh, resources, or you can call it experimental setup, whatever is appropriate. In this lab, you probably want to use the term resources because you're going to use an online modeling system to do that. In other labs, you're going to have you know, a list of the equipment that you use to create the, the wafers and, and that sort of thing. And then a, a brief description on the procedure. The procedure needs to be clear enough so people understand how you did it and where you got the information from. Um, but it doesn't need to be, you know, 20 pages of detailed procedures on how to use equipment and that sort of thing. Just an overview. And then you, you have to have a data section. And usually we put tables and graphs in there and some kind of text that, you know, allows the reader to understand what the tables and graphs mean. So I've given you an example here of what a table would look like. Here's a table caption that shows up. Table captions are usually above the tables and then figure captions come up come um, below the table. So you can do that in, in Word as well and I can show you how to do that if you don't know how to add um, captions to figures. Okay? Um, and I can, I can show you how to get tables from Excel files into the Word document if you need help with that. Um, and then here's a, an example of another graph taken out of Excel. Um, I didn't do a good job on this figure caption. You can see that it, it's wrapping around, so my bad. Um, and then you have a section for analysis, which you can also call conclusion. And here you want to put the answers to all the questions in the um, activity um, instruction set. And then you can cross-reference you know, in your analysis to other graphs and charts that you have within the document and there's a cross-reference command in Word that you could use. Um, and then also in the analysis or conclusion section uh, you want to include what you learned from this lab. So I'll be looking for the answers to all the questions and I'll be looking for um, you know what you've learned from this lab. So try to articulate what you learned. Think about what you would tell an uh, interviewer you know, if he asks you, well, what did you learn in this lab, if, if he happens to look at this in your portfolio, you have to be able to articulate that. So it's good if you write it down. That way, before an interview, you'd be able to review your portfolio and you'd be able to tell them a good story and, and be clear and concise and, and demonstrate that you really understand, you know, what you wrote about. That's key. Um, and I would like you to include a muddiest point, so if something in this, in this lab didn't quite work right or you didn't quite get it or you would like you know it would have been easier if I would have included better instructions or something along those lines feel free to put it in the muddiest points section this is optional I might give you some extra points for doing it um, so your lab you know grade will go up um, and this is for my information so I can improve on our on our units and on our on the way we present the information and of course I'd like you to put references in there and citations. So again, here, here are the links to how to do those kind of things um, effectively. And you know, as you go along, you might want to try to do the higher level IEEE citations method. Once you get the hang of it, it's not too hard. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close off this pop-up window. So we, we took a look at the um, lab report template. Now you might say, well, I don't know how to get this into a Word document. And you say, well, that's not really that critical because I've, I have the exact same thing in a Word doc. So if I click on that, um, in my computer it comes up with the download automatically so I can download it to a certain place. So for now I'm going to put it in, in downloads. 
So I'm going to download this file. Once it's downloaded, I can open it up in Word, and there it is. So now you can you can type it in. You know, mat, um, deposition um, calculation lab, right? So this makes it easy for you to write up, and then you can just you know backspace over authors and put your name down. So I'm going to put my name down here, and I'm going to put the class, and you get the idea, right? So this would be MEMS 2192, et cetera, et cetera. And then the overview, you know, again, this is the template, and it reminds you what you want to put in there. Now, I put these instructions in italics. I don't expect you to do everything in italics in this. Um, the reason I used italics is to show you that they're instructions. So you want to wipe those out and then write your, you know, write your own words there. Okay, so you can, you know, write whatever you want in here and, and um, you know, write in your abstract and all of that. And if you're not familiar with Word, there's lots of stuff online to teach you how to use these different uh, layouts and document elements, how to do tables, charts, that sort of thing. Okay, so you really want to do all of your graphing in Excel and then import it into, um, into Word. I don't recommend using the embedded Word um, tape or charts and, and uh, functions. You can play around with it if it works for you for simple graphs and simple data, then by all means feel free to do that. Okay? So that's that part. I'm going to go ahead and close it. I don't want to save anything. I'm back to my Moodle site. So, um, so I gave you a lab template. So the last thing I want to show you is the deposition lab assignment. So this is where you would submit your assignment after you write your lab report up and after you do your Excel file. And I'll jump over to Excel in a minute to show you how to do the Excel files. So for the deposition lab, you know, it comes up this way. You, you, you can see that you get two attempts, okay, and then you can submit two files with each attempt. Now it's not open right now, so that's why you don't have the, um, the submission um, uh, option uh, showing up in my screen here. But if you look up here, there's I'm going to try to put some additional special instructions to key you in on what's um, required. So if you look here in the description, it says read the previous assignment details, okay? And make sure that you complete all of the requested tasks and documentation before submitting, okay? So get it all done, write it all up, have it ready to go before you submit. Okay, if uh, you will submit a lab report in a PDF format, so write it up in Word, save the Word doc, and then do a save as in a PDF format. Try to upload the PDF format. Make sure it looks decent before you do that and the formatting is good. Okay, use the proper file naming convention. So we talked about this in a previous um, class, but I want to remind you of it. So wh what we all decided was last name, first initial, the name of the assignment, which you can call Deposition 1. We're going to probably do another lab related to deposition, so we'll probably call that Deposition 2. Okay, And then the year, month, and day that you submitted it. That way, if, if I ask you to redo something, or you get a really low grade, and you ask if you could you know, re resubmit it, and I agree to that, then you would change the year, month, and day so that you would know you have Rev1 and Rev2 in your own files. This is um, standard protocol for the way I work in my office. Um, I always have um, students fill it out this way so I know who it is, I know uh, what's it about, and I know the date and time it does it because I download all of your assignments and then I need to be able to sort through them and understand who, who did what so when I'm done grading it I'll upload the graded assignments again into Moodle so you can look at it and see the markup see, uh, see the grading on it. Okay on the Excel file you're gonna do the same thing it's actually got the same file name but the extensions different so this is a .xls file so it shouldn't get confused with your .pdf or .doc files. Okay. Now, if you have a heartburn and you can't figure out how to get it in a PDF format, you can go ahead and, and upload it in a, in a doc file, and then I can convert it into PDF later. But I prefer not to do that. It's just an extra step for me. And, you know, you're going to be asked to do very specific things in your job in the future. So, um, you know, you're going to need to do that as well. Okay? So that's that. I'm going to go back to the main thing.
All right, and I'll, I'll be, um, and I, I haven't done this yet, but I'll be um, probably putting some kind of Excel file in here so you can see how, how to do that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump to my Excel template, and I've already started playing with it. This is this is data from, from last year's class. Um, here's a, a crude version of the, of the um, graph, so you can kind of see what the output should end up looking like. So what you want to do is you want to fill out this data here, okay, for the different scenarios. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight scenarios. Remember there were six for the 111 wafers and two for the one or I mean two for the 111 wafers and six for the 100 wafers. So you can see these are the 100 wafers here that this student did and here's the 111 wafers. And he started with uh, 25 angstroms as the starting thickness. That's fine, you can do it that way. I'm okay with that. Um, so you'd say, okay, now I got all this data in this format, okay? And I can show you some more details when we're in the lab on that. But once you have data, in column form, you see that you know here's your x-axis information here, where it says time. Let me go ahead and blow this up a little bit. Yeah, now you can see it better. So this is time, this is thickness um, uh, versus time. So these are thicknesses for different times that you use the modeling software in the Brigham Young University Cleanroom website. So you get the data from them, and then once you have your data you want to plot it. So I'm only going to plot a little bit of it just to show you how to do it. So you you um, click and drag the data that you want to plot. I'm going to go out to uh, say five minutes. Okay, You're going to have to do it out to an hour, but I'll do it out to five minutes. So now I've selected this data set. Okay, Formatting is important. So I'm going to create a chart so you can see these tabs here, home, layout, tables, charts, Right? So I'm going to make a chart. And when we do real data, we usually do scatter charts. So that's x versus or y versus x or x versus y, however you want to look at it. So we're going to do a scatter chart. So we're going to pick scatter and we're going to do mark scatter. We're not going to bother with the lines yet. We're going to leave them as points. So if we click on that, you can see all the points. Okay, now this is a pretty ugly um, graph, and I don't have axis labels or anything. So I'm going to make it bigger so you can see kind of what the graph looks like. Okay, and I, I recommend that you use YouTube and find other um, sources um, that might help you fill in some of the blanks. But, you know, here we have our Y, here we have our X. This is a linear um, graph pretty much to five minutes, so you can see that it's a nonlinear graph function. It starts out at, a, at one slope and starts to uh, become another slope over time. Okay, so I want to I wanna just make this graph better. I got to do some Y labels, I got to do my X labels, uh, I might want to add some grid lines, and I definitely want to go log log on this because that's the requirement in this um, assignment. So you might say, well where do I do that? Well if you look here, um, you have chart layout functions, so that gives you chart title axis titles, legend, data labels if you want to do that, um, some more axis information here, axis formats, and adding grid lines. So most of your stuff is in the in the chart layout um, section in Excel. So if I click on um, title, I want to put a title above the chart. So I clicked on title above the chart and there's your title. So it says chart title. So you click in that field, you can backspace over it, and then you can type in oxide growth okay, versus uh, temperature, time, and crystal. Uh, cri can't spell. Crystal orientation. Okay. Then if you click somewhere on, else on the chart, you can see what that looks like. Now you can play with the with the fonts and all of that if you want, but the defaults are usually pretty decent and legible. Uh, it's important that it's legible in your write-up. So now we got that done. Now we go, okay, what about the x-axis titles? Well, that's here. You can, you know, do horizontal axis title. We'll put it below the axis, and you can see it shows up down here. 
and you can type in that. So that in this case it's time, but you always want to put units in all of your axis labels. So I would put time, and then parentheses you put minutes, right? So later on you might want hours, but you know the person looking at it doesn't know what these numbers are for unless you tell them. So now I've got the x-axis title and I can do the same thing for the y-axis, so that's the vertical axis. And you have a couple of choices here. You can do rotated title, vertical title, or horizontal title. Always go with the, uh, with the rotated title. Okay, so what is this? Well, this is thickness. Well, what are the units? Ah, I don't know. So we can go thickness, and then in parentheses you put A for angstroms. Okay, and if you decide later to divide all your thicknesses by, you know, um, by 10, then you have nanometers, right? And if you divide it by, uh, let's see, 10,000, then you have microns. But we usually work with, with angstroms, and that's fine. Uh, you can convert it to nanometers if you want. So now this, this would normally, you'd say, well, I'm pretty much done. But I am requiring you to do a log, gra um, log graph, and there's reasons for that. If you had my intro class, you know, we did the rainbow wafer um, experiment. So log log was real important to be able to read this data more accurately. So how do we do that? Well, you can go up to um, axes and click on that. And I'm going to change the vertical axis. And you can say no axis, default, thousands, millions, billions, or log scale. So you can pick log scale, and it automatically converts it to a log scale. So now you can see that it's pretty flat when you get to longer periods of time because it's a logarithmic function there. In the beginning of the oxidation, it's, it's not quite flat. Um, on a log-log scale, it's actually more linear right at the beginning. Okay? So you'd say, well, that looks pretty good. Um, but, you know, I got all this blank space down here. How do I change that? Well, if you double-click on the axes, you get this window coming up. And you can pick between scale, number, ticks, and all of that. So if you select scale, you can see what the minimum is. Well, in this case, the minimum is 1. That's down here. Well, we started at 25 angstrom, so we probably want the minimum to be 10. So we can go into this field and change it to a 10. And you can see it updates it automatically on the graph. Now we look pretty good. We hit OK. So that, that looks decent. We can do the same thing on the x-axis. OK, we want to um, we double click on that. It's, it's automatically linear right now. We can also change it to logarithmic here. It says it can't have zeros in it, right? So you say OK. So it got rid of the zero and started at 0.1 minutes, or 0.1, uh, yeah, 0.1 minutes. So now you have a log-log scale, OK? So if you want the x-axis to be logarithmic, you can do that. And then you can hit OK. Now this looks kind of crummy because now your y-axis is in the middle. If I want to move it to the right, if I double click on my y-axis, you see there's this other thing in here uh, that says horizontal axis crosses at. This one right here, horizontal axis crosses at. And it's telling to cross it at, at 10. Well, I want to cross at 0.1. Let's see if it'll let me do that. So 0.1. Right, 0 0.1 if you want, then maybe you can see the formatting there. You hit OK, and nothing happened. So <laughs> sometimes Excel is a bit finicky. Um, uh, I'm not sure why it, why it didn't do that correctly. Uh, oh, I have to check it. Oh, it's not going to let me do it. Um, Oh, I know what I did wrong. This is the horizontal axis. We want the vertical axis to cross. Let's see if we can do that. No, it won't let me do it. Okay. So um, it worked for me earlier. I'm not sure why. Maybe because I have to play with some of the other numbers. Well, you get the idea. If You, you can move these axes to the left or the right. Um, and so, you know, we're pretty much done. Let's say you want to put a grid in here. You can click on axes. Um, let's see if I can get that to work again. Um, and you can do tick marks. Okay. And major ticks, minor ticks. I'm going to go ahead and make a cross on the minor ticks. 
and the major ones I just want on the outside. So now you can see that it is a logarithmic scale by the tick marks. You can go ahead and do vertical grid lines for the minor and horizontal grid lines um, minor as well. Okay, so now it looks like a typical log log type of scale that you would have and that I might print out and have you do in the classroom. Okay, now you might say, well, this is pretty busy here, the, the legend. If you click on the legend and right click, uh, you can go to format legend. And you can also do that in the, um, in the formatting tools up here. You can get the same thing. So I'm going to format the legend, and I don't want the legend to be on the right. I want to put it on the bottom. So sometimes people like to put the legend on the bottom. It they have more space to play with, there's not as much wasted space, and then the, the graphs themselves become more apparent. And of course, you can, you can add a line to the, to the graph, so you can, let's say this is a, an interesting graph right here. I can click on it, and then I can, um, let's see, uh, format data series. And I can add all kinds of different things. So I'm going to add a line to it. Right now, the default's no line. I'm going to add a line to it and make it black. Okay, so now you can see a black line. I can make it uh, very dark, or I can increase the transparency and make it kind of um, see-through, I guess would be the word. You can change the gradient. Uh, you can change the weight. The weight's usually what I play with. I go a little bit thinner, maybe. 2 point instead of 3.75. I can make it a dashed line, right? I can make it a thicker dashed line, you know. And if you want to, you know, point something out in your graphs, you can maybe put a line through one of them. And then in your text, you can say refer to the graph and the one that has the line drawn through it, you know, and you can talk about that. So, you know, this is pretty, pretty straightforward as well. So you can see I've created a nice nice graph. I want to put that in my Word document. I can click on it. I can right click. I can say copy. Okay. I hit OK. Uh, then I go to my Word doc. Um, and my computer's thinking for a while. But I can do a, a paste. And if you paste a, a graph, I'll start with a blank um, Word doc. Bear with me here. Uh, I didn't want that. Let's go to view, draft. Okay, here we go. Print layout. That's the one I usually like to use. So I'm in print layout in Word, and I already copied from my Excel file. Now I can do a file, I mean an edit, paste special. Right? I don't want to put a Microsoft Office graphic object. I want to actually do a PDF. And there's a good reason to do that. If you have a PDF, you can um, mess with the, with the scaling pretty well. And you can see the writing's really, really small for this graph. So if that happens to you, you want to go back to the Excel file, and you can um, adjust the, the size and all of that of the graphics to make it bigger so you can see it. Okay, so I'll let you guys figure that one out. All right, so, you know, I, I ran through this rather fast. You can stop and go back at any time. Um, I just wanted to give you an overview of it. Uh, let me get back to the um, Moodle site. So now you have a, a decent idea of what's required for this lab. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording and uh, put it on YouTube. Thanks for your time, and I hope this works out for you.